application on a mobile platform. I mean, you're you're walking around and it's like, okay, tell me what I'm interested in that's within blah miles of me. And yeah, I'm that's sorry, cool. that's going to be addictive. And that that's if they integrate that like I think they're going to into ice cream, I, I'm sorry. That's it's, well, I, I've, been, sorry. Well, I, it's I've been making comments about that for a while on a Google Plus because I think that was a fantastic, as you say, it, it probably is rather addictive. And maybe even a little bit unhealthy, but I find it fascinating to to know, you know, if there's somebody three miles down the road from me who's uh, who's writing something about Linux or, or free and open source software, something that I'm interested in. So I think it's a fantastic idea. Um, and like I was saying earlier, I'm sort of torn between Google Plus and Diaspora. I know I can't keep them both going forever because it's a, a considerable drain of my time. And what I have found is this, and these are sort of very very brief pros and cons for each one. Google Plus has got Hangouts, which is fantastic. I think it's an absolute brilliant technology and has, has worked flawlessly every time I've used it. Um, it's also got the chat uh, system, which is very similar to Facebook. Um, uh, honestly, I'm not sure. I, uh, based on like that Twitter plugin they have, of course, you have to be using Chrome or Chromium to use it, but setting that aside for a moment. Uh, but I, I'm honestly seeing as the API gets developed, why it'll probably take a year or two, you won't have to make the choice between either or. You'll just get a plug-in for Chrome or Chromium that will plug in your other thing through your Google Plus and allow you to interact with it through your Google Plus. So they're really trying to build a uh, social ID platform there. It's, I mean, like I said, the, the Hangouts and the, the chat was the one area of advantage for Google Plus, and of course you've got some big names on there as well. So that's the one sort of drawer of Google+. Plus. However, Diaspora hasn't got the chat, it hasn't got the Hangouts, but it is far more relevant. I've found the conversations I've had on there have been far more relevant to the topics I'm interested in. The main selling point of Diaspora is the hashtags, which is something that Google+, Plus doesn't have. And it makes it very easy to find anybody who's tweeting, uh, sorry, denting or whatever you want to call it on Diaspora, about topics I'm interested in, whereas Google Plus doesn't have that feature. So there's that. And also, the strange thing I found is I've got a far larger circle of friends on Diaspora than I have on Google Plus, which doesn't make a lot of sense when you look at how many people took up Google Plus in the first couple of weeks of its uh, a big think it's introduction. already a circle. I mean, the, the Diaspora in general is already a circle of people because they kind of... The, there is a, a predisposal to sort of select a certain group of people who have a certain thing in common. Uh, so they might be caring about privacy or free software and things like that. Um, and I, I think that's just what matters uh, if you're looking for people who are like yourself. Uh, and I think like what he's saying, it's going to depend what fringe peg of society you're in. If you care about things that, regrettably, 90% of people don't care about, you're probably going to have a lot more prosper on the Diaspora side than you would on the mm. Google Plus side. Contrary. This is one of the reasons that you get less trolling in... Uh, yeah. I personally get less trolling in Identica than in Twitter, because in Twitter I have also my so-called enemies or people who don't like me, uh, because that's a wider um, circle of people, and that happens to include those who are against free software, which is really what mostly Identica is about. It's, it's kind of like the Twitter for people who are kind of conscious of the fact that Twitter is not quite so free... Uh, well, they try to paint themselves as free software friendly by releasing something open source once in a while, but it, it's not really a platform you control. And something very important I just want to point out, <clears throat> there is a new feature in Identica <clears throat> which lets you uh, download all of your activity. In my case, it's over 50,000 uh, dents or so, and it allows you to download the whole thing. So this, this is an illustration of the fact that they do uh, allow you to take away your data, even if it's a very big bulk of information. Because that's one of the principal things that they had. This is one of the feature requests that they had back in the beginning of 2009 when I joined Identica. The one, one of the first thing I said is, can I download my whole data and take it away with me? Because I had some bad experiences with these services before. You know, they can shut down with all of your data. And even if they gave you your data, you don't really have any, anything to put data in in order to actually display the data. You don't create the schema of the database. What I, what I would say, I mean, first if I could just end on um, something about uh, Jasper V, Google Plus, if, there's a, if there even is a battle. Um, I found that the community is uh, far better, not better, far more relevant in Diaspora. And certainly if I'm talking about people I feel closer connected to, that would probably be Diaspora and the experiences I've had of that. Um, and also, Diaspora, Identica, 
you're less likely, I stress less likely, to get people that appear to be very friendly who are actually just trying to sell you something, whereas on Twitter, and I assume Facebook, so don't use this, maybe those type of users are more common where you've got large uh, corporations who've got many, many different Twitter accounts that are trying to get on there to sell you things and are not interested in these sort of social side of things. They're using it as a means uh, to an end to uh, promote their products. Um, so, so that's what I found with the uh, diaspora, and, and certainly I'm, I'm having a great experience on both uh, uh, both services at the moment. I think that's so. the curse of scale. It's going to happen to Google Plus yeah. as well pretty soon. Oh, very yeah, good. yeah. No, uh, I mean uh, last month, actually earlier this month, eBay was doing seminars where they're you know inviting all their power sellers and are saying, okay, here's how you use social media, and like one of the things they cover, okay, go get this automated thing which will tweet your item and Facebook your item every 20 minutes or hour or 12 hours. Basically, they're saying spam social media. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, y y you know, it it's when everybody starts doing that, it's just like email spam. It it's, it just becomes noise. It's not legitimate. And nobody wants anything to do with it. <gasps> Well, what, what I'd like to just go back to very quickly, um, it was a comment Roy made, because we, myself and Roy had a, a very brief discussion about this on RC a few hours before we uh, recorded the show. And uh, it was the comment that Roy made about uh, Identica and allowing you to uh, retrieve all your dents over the years. And so you've got a backup and uh, a record of all your, of all your dents. And in Roy's case, it's about 50,000, did you say, Roy? Um, yeah. my, my first question, and because I see a lot of this, and I see a lot of people, not, not Roy, because this is the first time I've ever spoken to him about this, but I've seen a lot of people promoting this type of um, feature as being a great thing. But if you look at the case of a dent to occur for a second, my question is, why would you want your 140 character posts from two years ago? And what possible it's use would they be to you in the future? Well, if you look at my file system, you probably realize this pretty soon. I mean, I've got like half a million files and I tend to keep all my very old emails and even I can show you like screenshots from the 90s or something when I was a kid. Mm. Uh, the reason is, no, sometimes you do look at these things, but one of the things that happens now, just to give you a side old story, I don't know why, I've got three screens in front of me and basically they change every one minute. The wallpaper changes and all my windows are basically translucent, like 40% translucent. So I'm seeing uh, every one minute in each screen, basically I'm seeing the in at random pictures of uh, uh, of all kinds of things I've collected over the years. Now, at the time when I was collecting those photos, I didn't train really know when I'd find a time to look at them. But now that I'm actually sitting and even doing this podcast and seeing all those pictures kind of mm. revolving around it, about 10,000 of them. Mm. Uh, and it's pretty useful. Now, the thing was with email, sometimes you remember that you wrote something to someone a long time ago. Now, even if 10 years ago you didn't have a very good indexer to take these things and put the, and take the semantics out of them, a few years back, I think about five, six years ago, even on Linux, you had the uh, Google Desktop, uh, which would basically index in a very useful way some of the keywords and things in your email. And now you can find a very quick way of accessing all your very old emails to specific people and to find them very well. Uh, you find a way to get all access to, like, uh, I don't know, all CVs of people and all kinds of uh, uh, data which you didn't really realize you had. Maybe you make some copies of old web pages. Uh, and, and finding all of that stuff is, is pretty easy, it's pretty valuable at times. I'm not sure if you've had experience where you looked for an email you wrote to somebody five oh. years ago, and then maybe you can bring it up to a person. No, I, I, I completely agree. I mean, things when you get to the level of um, a personal communication, there could be a plethora of reasons why you'd want to keep it. It could be a business agreement. It could be a communication with a long lost friend and a new address. What that, that, I've got well, no and, and when it, I was going to say, when it comes to business, especially for yeah. both legal liability and. Um, so on and so forth. You really want to keep stuff for a minimum of five to seven years. But with the context I'm putting into now is the social networking context. I mean, space is very is very cheap. Uh, if I know that I dented something around 2010, and by the way, this this is based on real things that happen. So sometimes I remember that I posted something about social networking in 2008, and then I can go through my archives and do a very very quick search, and I can find it within like seconds. And that is useful because then I can give people the right link in the right time. Today I had a discussion about Vista 7 being a failure, and I call it Vista, Vista 7 because that's what I always call it. Uh, and and uh, and basically it's really hard to use, I basically showed my friend that the reason I collected a very extensive sort of catalog of all the failures is because I know that they have agents being paid about in total something like half a billion dollars 
to basically do the, what they call search engine optimization and technical evangelism and perception management and reputation management and all uh, these other things. Don't talk have. about that. You're, you're making me sad because I have ethics and I don't take Yeah, well, like it's that. all this Google, they basically Google bomb the search engine that they do all this optimization and stuff. So when you search for anything, Windows 7, even you search for Windows